Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, you giving me the opportunity to go a little bit about order here. Um, Secretary uh, Warner, it's good to see you. Uh, all the work you've done in Virginia, your family, um, really proud what Mountaineers, and uh, it's good to have you before the committee. I, I do want to ask you a couple questions. First, as we have members of the military overseas fighting for our freedoms, and with that being said, there's no better place to focus our attention on the ability to give our military veterans and our service members the, the right to vote. Uh, what are the tools that you're using in West Virginia to increase military um, opportunities to vote? The most prominent is the uh, ability to vote using a mobile device. I had trouble, I was in Afghanistan for five years and I had trouble voting. I went six months without being able to send or receive mail. Uh, my sons and daughters, all four, have served in the military. Every one of them has had trouble voting. My brother's roommate, uh, Shane Kimbrough, was commander of SpaceX. How's he supposed to vote on the space station if it's not using some sort of mobile device? Uh, that's why I, one of the first things I did when I went into office was I said, let's come up with an electronic way to transmit and receive uh, ballots. So uh, that's what we've done in the state of West Virginia, and uh, who better than our military. But also, we've ex it worked so well in West Virginia that we went to voters with certain disabilities and now uh, first responders. We actually deployed first responders to the state of Mississippi to, on a hurricane disaster relief within the six-day period prior to an election, so they lost that ability to vote. That's why we've championed that. We now have a verifiable system to both uh, check that the ballot that they send is the ballot received. So we're advancing that technology in those limited circumstances. I don't adv advocate going mainstream with this. I simply want it for those people who otherwise would be disenfranchised. And I, and I appreciate that. Uh, my next question is going to be to you, Mr. Palmer. Um, the security and performance of election equipment used by our states and our localities has been under significant scrutiny. We've heard concerns from the public that about the fact that there are components of our election equipment being manufactured outside of the United States. Is it true that there are certain components of the election equipment that are not made in America? Uh, that is true. So what would it take to reshore some of the election equipment used in the country's elections? Well, that would, sir, that would be a significant endeavor uh, since most of the voting equipment does use uh, sources from outside the country it would probably raise the uh, price of uh, election equipment significantly. Um, there could be uh, some requirements to assemble in the United States. Um, there are other risk manage management strategies to sort on the supply chain, but there, there would be a significant cost uh, to that for election equipment on the states. What, what, what countries are these, uh, are these components being manufactured? Uh, for, there, you, you have the Philippines, you have uh, Taiwan, where you might have certain, um, certain components, even Italy, um, European, un, you know, European countries, um, and perhaps even China. Um, but so there are states, uh, there are nations out there that, uh, in the supply chain that provide materials that we don't, we simply don't manufacture um, today in, in mass quantities. So it's safe to say that, that there could be companies that are Chinese that whether they are manufacturing them or whether they have ownership of those companies that are actually Chinese companies? Well, Chinese companies are providing components and materials to, uh, to, to a piece of voting equipment, a voting system that um, is then manufactured by one of the vendors. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Palmer. Mr. Chairman, yield back.